So we're going to start with just a bit of movement, like five minutes or less. Um, if you don't want to move, you can uh, sit still and adapt. I'll give you some instructions if you're just sitting there, so that's fine. But if you'd like to move a bit, you can stand with me. I'm going to just do this little move. I've just intuitively found it useful these days to sometimes begin a sitting period with just a bit of movement. And it's really uh, just an encouragement or an invitation to the system to discharge for energy to keep moving. It's doing that. You know, energy is moving in the body all the time. But this kind of bracing or holding that we do even without knowing it. It's just an invitation and yeah, some awareness around letting that go. So wave or give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay. Cool, all right. So it's just good to bring that intention, to presence that intention. And we're going to just move back and forth on our heels onto the balls of our feet and onto the heel. And we can even bounce a little, just bounce on the heels. And let the bones move and the joints open. And you can even shake a little bit from here, just shake, bounce, shake, do whatever intuitively feels useful, just to invite energy to move. You can roll the neck, move the arms, twist. And then when you're ready, you can find some stillness again. And we'll just let the body sway in a way it wants to, just slowing down, swaying, moving like seaweed. Not really directing the body anywhere, just seeing where it wants to go. And it might be intuitive to deep breathing. That's okay. Just allow that to be. You might intuitively either straighten or bend a little. Change the position of the pelvis. Bend or straighten the legs. And then when you're ready, just taking your place on your chair, seat or cushion. And we'll continue with this movement of energy by doing a little humming practice. And this is similar to how we might approach chanting. And there are many different approaches, of course, but 
In this way, we're just going to invite the throat chakra to open. Invite the muscles to release or tighten doing their job, of course. But inviting as much ease into the throat, to the neck. And as we're humming, we're not trying to make a beautiful sound even. We're not trying to generate any goodwill or metta. We're just simply inviting the sound to emerge naturally from the body as it knows how to do. And there might be some relationship here to this activity that you're even considering doing now. It might be a similar attitude that we brought to practice tonight, either one of some kind of interest, or maybe like, I don't want to do this. I'd rather be doing something else. I don't like this kind of thing. And that's great. You know, if that's here, that's wonderful. Whatever's here is wonderful. It's nature. It's just exactly as it should be. And we're not like trying to glorify any complicated mind states or negative emotions, but we're just appreciating and honoring them for the expression of nature that they are. So if there's interest in the mind, we're accepting that on the in-breath and then releasing it without holding, without clinging, with an open throat, with the relaxed body, as we generate the sound of the hum. Mm -hmm. And if there's complaining mind happening, then we're approaching it the same way. Uh, just an honoring of this expression of nature just as it is. Accepting it on the in-breath and releasing it, not holding, just releasing it through the sound of the hum on the exhale. So we'll just do this muted in our own way. We can each find our way with this. So we'll do it for just a minute or so.
And we'll move right into our stillness or quietness from here. And from this practice, there might be a natural connection with the body. The capacity to feel the sensations that are moving. And we can approach our practice here, just as we did with the chanting, the humming. And bringing a relaxed, easeful presence. And any obvious noticing of rejection, we're trying to hold on. We can feel dukkha, the reality of dukkha right here. Meeting each experience with gentle awareness. and inviting release. Remembering to keep our practice simple and local. Cold fingertips. Don't like it. Spaciousness in the chest. Want more of that. Or whatever your reality is. Each arising is a force of nature. Each experience arising into consciousness, the relationship to the experience, all a force of nature. And even if it's slight, on some level we understand this. We understand we don't have control over the body
And there's no sense of holding on. That, that understanding is young or fragile. It's perfectly fine. And just keep watching, observing. Reconnecting. Remembering that we're not trying to make anything happen. We're not trying to fabricate a positive experience or transcend the ordinary. Really feeling into what it's like to have a body And it's this really local curiosity that shapes deep wisdom. Observing experience as it comes and goes. Noticing that sensation that was just so interesting is now completely vanished. And if our space is noisy or the mind is chattering away, there's no problem here either. You can practice cultivating this attitude of inclusion. Being curious about the possibility of spaciousness with any experience, with any reality. Just here in our humanness, cultivating non resistance and allowing truth to deepen on its own. And we'll continue in silence now.
And then opening your eyes whenever you're ready. Thanks for your practice, everyone. Feel free to move or stretch if you'd like. You can also use the chat to say hello. Look around, wave at each other, offer a smile. Hey, just appreciating being together. I've really been enjoying this chapter and the book, Listening to the Heart. And if you're hearing that for the first time, it's okay. You don't have to have read the book. But I am teaching from this book called Listening to the Heart, A Contemplative Journey to Engaged Buddhism by Tanisra and Kitty Saro. And so this we're on chapter 8, if you're following along. The chapter is... Uh, written by Kitty Sorrow this time, and it's entitled Dewdrops and a Lightning Flash. And I'll just read this short passage from the book. He says, Sometimes when I'm struggling and worrying, I look at the mountain that cradles Dharmagiri, which is the monastery in South Africa that he and Tanisara founded, and consider its 220 million year old presence. In a few years, everything I've worried about won't matter. All the concerns about building a hermitage or promoting outreach programs, the reaction to the opinion of others, the tides of likes and dislike, it will all dissolve back into the great void. Even the mountains and this great earth will one day disappear. To attune one's life day by day to the fundamental emptiness of reality is to hone an inner practice of letting go, acting and letting go, doing what needs to be done, and then once again putting down the stress that the clinging mind generates. In this beautiful storytelling way, He just, again and again, invites us to explore our practice and our lives, really, with a sense of wonder and awe, even. And I don't know about you, but I feel like I really need this, to invite in a sense of wonder these days. Life can feel hard. So many people I talk to express what... I often feel, and that's, I just don't feel that great right now. You know, life is just challenging. There's so many important and complicated realities to relate to, and this heart does that with some skill sometime, but not all the time. And we can feel sometimes stuck in practice in this way that we're somehow trying to get our practice to help us deliver the goods, right? Or to deliver the goods to us. Like, heal me, fix me, make all this complicated humanness go away. And that's not what happens most of the time, or, well, any of the time for me, maybe some of the time for you. (laughs) But, Doing simple things, ordinary things like taking a walk and really appreciating with a sense of wonder just the mystery of nature or finding ways to relate to this human embodied experience with a similar attitude. It's been really important 
This teaching on emptiness is a central teaching of the Buddha. And it can seem a bit cold or something, but it's a matter of perspective. And I, for me, the teaching on emptiness can really evoke a sense of warmth and inclusion. So it's really like, what is your entry point into the teaching? <clears throat> One of my teachers and mentors, Rebecca Bradshaw, I know she's been a teacher to some of you too, we're having a conversation about emptiness and <clears throat> she was expressing one view that emptiness might be this expression of nobody home. So this expression that nature is alive and expressing itself and emergent in an emergent way in every moment without a, se- a sense of self that's actually making something happen. Right? That all experience is a force of nature and not a personal experience, although it may feel that way. So one expression of emptiness could be nobody home or no one home. And another expression of emptiness can be everything home. So this inclusive sense that all of this belongs, every expression of our hearts, every thought in our minds, every reality in the external world, every body sensation, every bit of health, every bit of sickness, it all belongs. Because it arose in this mysterious and really beautiful and awe-inspiring way. Like the mystery of how conditions come together, we'll never quite understand. So we can receive our lives with the same in the same way. Like oh, everything belongs, everything home, everything home. I texted a good Dharma friend, Young O, who has been a teacher here on Tuesday nights for uh, several months. You know, not so much recently because he's busy, but he'll be teaching the year-end retreat from with me in a, in a year from now. So hopefully we'll be able to do that in person, but that's the plan. And he's a real devoted student of Tanisaro and Kittisaro. So I asked him in, you know, afternoon small talk way, how do you talk about emptiness? <laughs> and he said, I try to make space for the possibility for Dharma to be really emergent and expressed. Less self, more nature. And then he he also texted me a picture of the space that he was headed to to meditate. This beautiful creek and big canyon. So making space for possibility and Dharma for Dharma to be emergent. And Kitty Saro talks about, um, describes emptiness and uses this image of dewdrops. And we can think about dewdrops as being like a mysterious force of nature. These drops that are just there when the conditions are right. But they're really an interrelated result of the atmosphere and the earth and the air and the sun and the moon and the people and these dewdrops arise when the conditions are right and they vanish when the conditions aren't supportive anymore. Thich Nhat Hanh calls this uses one way to describe emptiness as interbeing. And that's just simply this interrelated nature of all experience. And Kitty Sarrell describes when he's talking about dewdrops, he was even talking about the way that we relate to dewdrops. 
or lightning flashes. But sometimes we, the conceptual mind will kick in and really try to understand it. You know, like, oh, a dewdrop, it's so beautiful, it glistens, it looks like diamonds, something like this. And yet those words don't quite capture the essence of the dewdrop, right? It's a mysterious little phenomenon, a dewdrop that emerges. And in the conceptualizing of it, we're, we can try to sort of appropriate it, you know, like, oh, this is so beautiful. Like the mind just creates a story out of the dewdrop. It's beautiful or it's not beautiful, whatever it is. And somehow in this conceptualizing of experience, even in which is what the mind does naturally to try to make sense of the world, but in this meaning making experience of conceptualizing, it does diminish the quality of the experience itself. So living into the mystery of causality, the mystery of emptiness, even. You know, allowing the heart to really soak that in and not try to figure it out or try to conceptualize it anyway all the time can be such a, a beautiful way to live and has been a supportive way for me to practice and live these days. Because the mind does, is doing all kinds of things. This mind thinks a lot. And there's a lot of things to think about and worry about. And this mind is really proficient at worrying, let me tell you. So this curiosity or this um, invitation really for the whole system, this mind-body experience to rest and to wonder, like with a real sense of awe, like a oh, human experience is really wild. And there's no capturing it in a few words or even a discourse. But it's alive in an emergent way. And may I really appreciate that in the same way that I might appreciate the morning dew or the morning frost or the mid-morning sun that comes out periodically or the dreary day that is also a force of nature. I am Mindanandi, who is a, a, a nun living in Canada and a really amazing teacher. She said, we connect with the faculty of understanding each in our own way. It is a native intuition, a sensibility. It is not a think. It is no thing a certain mysterious energy that we tap into. When we tap into it, we can't think about it. We can't even really speak about it, but it can intuit. We go into it. We go there fearlessly. We want safety. This intuitive way is totally safe. And often this conceptualizing that we do, trying to make sense of our lives and of the world, is a way of seeking safety. I was walking down the street and there was a color, color like an orange in the distance and in a place that it didn't seem like, you know, that's not what I remember in this, down the street that I walk every day. And it was very interesting watching the mind like, you know, I could just feel, I actually could feel the pull of it, like wanting to figure out what that was, you know? It just wasn't, it wasn't good enough to rest in the not knowing. There was this leaning in to try to understand it. Oh, that's the train. The train is moving. And then when there was that getting it, there was a relaxing, like, ah. Oh, now my life makes sense again. 
And so this is just a normal thing that our minds do, right? Use conceptual thought to make sense of our lives, to feel safe. And so this resting into an intuitive wisdom that is beyond conceptualizing, you know, it takes a lot of practice. And it takes the conditions to be supportive of that. I really appreciate the ordinary and this and some, this is how the Buddha taught about emptiness actually. He taught in real practical ways using the relative to understand the absolute. So using the relative, our relative experiences, our embodied experiences, the mundane, to understand these deep truths like emptiness. I was, and we can use our ordinary experience for this, in this way. So it's not like we have to somehow go off to a cave to practice to understand the nature of emptiness. It's really possible to wake up to this reality right here in our, right here in the context of our daily lives. And I was uh, talking to a friend a few days ago, last weekend actually, and this is another Dharma friend of mine who lives in California. And we were, you know, the conversation, I, what, one of the things I appreciate about um, this friend is that our conversations tend to f- kind of go in the direction that they want to go. And maybe you have this experience too where you, sit down in conversation with someone you care about without an objective, right? But just an interest in connecting. And then there's a kind of flow and a rhythm that emerges from that intention just to connect. And so this is what was happening between us. And because I've been studying this, it was really interesting to sort of be amazed by this natural expression flowing right between us in the relational field. One of the things we were talking about is uh, she's Marie Kondoing her place, she said, her apartment. She was going (laughs) room to room and doing some really intentional organizing and finding it a deep Dharma practice to understand the meaning and the relationship to all of the things that she could touch and really being curious about what the heart is holding on to and what it's not holding on to. And so just ordinary expressions of how we might view or how we might relate to our lives in a way that's supportive of deepening into this truth of emptiness. Our things, we have things and they hold some significant meaning to us. And it's hard to let them go and hard to see them as things, right? They are mementos or they represent something. One of the central ways that the Buddha talks about this teaching of emptiness is by, is through the five aggregates, the five aggregates of clinging. So it's basically the Buddha's way of this, of answering the question, what is this? What is this existence? And so he uses kind of two different maps to point to what is this? One is the five aggregates and another map is talking about the the six sense spheres that basically we can sum up our experience in either these five or these six ways. So these six ways would be what we see, what we hear, what we smell, what we taste and what we touch 
and then the activity of the mind or awareness of the thoughts and emotions that we have as examples. And then this other map, the five khandas, he uses these, you know, one, these five bundles or heaps of things, categorizations of this human experience, right? So form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness. So what's interesting to me, one of the things that's interesting to me about this map is that one is body and four are mind, right? So right from the beginning, even before we really dig into what the map's about, we can see the importance of the mind and how the mind and how we relate to life That's embedded right here in this map. And as Kitty Saro talks about the five khandas a bit too in this chapter, it's the Buddha's analytical way of demonstrating that there's no use in clinging to a thing something that we might conceptualize as a thing when the thing is really hard to pin down. It's hard to cling to this sense of myself in this body when we pull apart this body into its components, right? The arms, the legs, the eyes, the tissue, the organs, the sense of smell, the sense of taste. You know, where is the self in that? It's hard to see the self when we start to really unpack our experience, even with the body. And when we start to unpack our total experience as human beings, it gets even more challenging to see a a self. And we start to use our mindfulness practice to see like, oh, look at this. This is just perception right here. The mind is perceiving this. Or the mind is constructing something. The mind is constructing a a train here, right? Like this is coming into view. It's not just the eyes taking in what the eyes do. But it's actually a construction of mind that's happening to help me feel safe in the world. And with the aggregate or the heap or the bundle of feeling, we can start to see that the mind has a lot of preferences, right? And often those preferences are to gravitate towards what feels good or what feels pleasant, to move away from what feels unpleasant, and to completely ignore what's neutral, And then as we dig in, you know, we could spend weeks talking about the five khandas or the five aggregates of clinging, the five ways that we misinterpret our actual experience and create a sense of self, the ways that we look for safety because it feels difficult to live into the uncertainty, the truth of uncertainty, the truth of nature, the truth of emptiness. So instead we construct this false sense of a me so that this makes sense. So the point of meditation is to become aware, right? to use our mindfulness practice, our awareness practice, to start to wake up to the truth of these, the simplicity of these experience, the raw nature of 
experience. And see how in this waking up, we can start to see, notice the process of clinging, the process of clinging. Often, well, let me read a bit from Kitty Sorrow. He says, naming these five categories in just a way of pulling the threads out from the woven tapestry of our experience. I'm sorry. Naming these five categories is just a way of pulling the threads out from the woven tapestry of our experience. A contemplative aid to encourage the seeker to reflect carefully on the nature of reality. In each waking moment, the khandas weave together to support the sense of me and the world. In concert, they create the illusion of cohesion and solidity. However, the Buddha said it is not so. Suppose a person beheld the many bubbles on the Ganges as they floated along. This is the Buddha now. And after a careful examination, saw how each appeared empty, unreal, and insubstantial. In exactly the same way carefully examining the five khandas, we discover them to be empty, void, and without a permanent self. Often there's an analogy used by teachers of a house to describe a sense of self. You know, a house with different rooms, maybe perhaps to describe each of the sense doors. And one way of bringing a sense of awe and mystery to this experience of ourselves or, you know, ourself, you know, using this image of a house is to think about opening all the doors, opening a door to each of the rooms, opening all of the sense doors and not resisting the flow of life. So it's an inclusive way of relating to the body and to who we are by allowing life to be as it is. And this is an attitude that we bring to our practice that we often talk about. This attitude of yes, yes, it is like this. There's no sense in resisting life because it is this way already. And resisting doesn't help. Resisting actually causes suffering. And we can feel that and know that. And so when we practice, we can bring that like sense of, okay, what is it like to be here right now? What is it like to be alive? What is it like to be human? Right? Without limiting our practice in any particular way. So we let allow sound to be a part of our experience. We invite sights to be a part of our experience. We invite critters, nature, other people, expressions the co- in the collective, systems, mind-made systems, We allow every expression of nature to be in the field without any resistance. And if this sounds a bit weird, you could try it on. Just pick a moment, any ordinary moment will do, and go, huh, what is it like to not have any agenda, to allow nature to be nature, life to be life, this body to be this body, this heart to be this heart, to allow thought to be there in the mind, conceptualizing to be there, safety seeking to be there, desire to be there, wanting, not wanting, whatever it is. And it's in this way of relating 
this maybe new or um, toddler-like way of relating to life, that we start to feel, get a taste of freedom. We start to see actually, oh, when there's no holding on, when there's just this willingness to allow nature to be nature, it doesn't feel that stressful. And we can even deepen into our understanding of emptiness right here because we learn not to take life so personally. In this interest, you know, when I cultivate this interest or curiosity, just me, Shelley, in my own life, I really accept my own challenging ways a lot more easily. Every stream of anxiety, every bit of fear or aversion of any kind, it starts to feel a little more acceptable. Like, oh, this is just a really mysterious force of nature in this moment. Even when the mind sort of unskillfully relates to those moments and does something or says something, you know, this happens to me all the time. I realize there's a little bit of, you know, um, aversion in the mind, but there's not enough wisdom to stop myself from saying the dumb thing. And I say the dumb thing and then I go, oh, wow, look at that, sweetie. That was really kind of unskillful. And then I do what I can do to repair because that's what mature adults do. (laughs) We work towards repair, even if it's not fun. But there's a lot of forgiveness on the back end because of this willingness to cultivate a sense of yes to life and to meet that with a sense of wonder. This is from Shohaku Okamura, who is a Zen Buddhist priest in Indiana, I believe. When we see emptiness, we realize there is no hindrance, no obstacles to block our life force. It is soft and flexible like a plant that tries to go around a big rock and continues to grow. Where there, where, where is always some other, there is always some other way to live, some other way to grow. An image that pops into my mind quite often is this, um, you know, I love this, like when there's really windy days, not now, not in winter so much, but in spring or in fall and the leaves are green on the trees or the plants. And there's wind that's just whipping around the plant. It seems like the plant might break, but it doesn't, right? Those stems and those tiny little stems, often these like little fragile things, you could just pluck them off. No, just how to move with the right kind of flexibility to move with nature, right? With the wind currents, with the rain, with the sleet even. It's such an amazing thing to me. And often, you know, I can just take a moment and be there with the leaves and remember that, oh, this expression of a life can be flexible too, can learn how to grow, can find its way around the rocks. I have... um, been exploring more devotional practice, which I've talked a bit about but in recent years and for sure since the pandemic um, in this, because it really does kind of inspire this heart to uh, a sense of wonder. Because I don't quite know what's happening there often in moments when I'm chanting or doing some bowing practice or just doing a simple contemplation. You know, this is something I do quite often, like a little bit of time in prayer or a contemplation of interconnection 
you know, of lineage or ancestry and remembering that this body is not mine. You know, it is genetic material from many human beings throughout history. And it's such a, like, really beautiful thing to just be there with that reflection for a moment. And often I'll do the same thing when I'm, uh, my partner and I have started, well, maybe the past six months we do a lot more praying together um, every day, at least once, sometimes more than that. And this prayer time is a time of deep emergence for each of us, and we take turns alternating. It's your turn, it's my turn. And often it's a calling on the ancestors for support and offering some gratitude for the life that we have. And and often it's a time, especially before meals, to reflect on the interdependent nature of all experience. So to appreciate that this food a human being good and that we had the money by the food and that the food was transported to the grocery store by the various means and that many migrant farm farm workers risk their lives to pluck the food out of the the vegetables out of the ground you know and so on there's just endless nuances to how a meal, to how far back we can trace a meal. So that sense of wonder right there in the midst of, you know, a simple prayer, just a reflection to ground the heart and some reality like, oh, this food is really a result of nature. It's a result of conditions, you know, that have varied over time and soil conditions and the atmospheric conditions and the different seasons and the different flavors of worldly conditions that influence how successful farmers are, for example, how much opportunity there is there. And it's also a way of, of really deepening into what is sacred about life. So emptiness, realizing this is not mine, that all experience is empty of something that's personal, but is a result of nature, is an expression of the sacred. And that moment of prayer in the midst of eating or right before eating, or a moment of prayer before going to bed, or these ceremonial times in our day, these ordinary but ceremonial times in our day, can be a real profound deepening into and honoring the sacred in life. I know I was certainly influenced. It feels hard to say much more about prayer without bringing in my grandfather, who was a Southern Baptist preacher. And one of the, I have a few really um, significant memories about around praying with him. And often he would um, sit alone and read and study and pray at home and also come to church. When he wasn't preaching, he would come to, we lived about 45 minutes away from him, so we would drive up and come to church with us. And it was a different rhythm at our Presbyterian church (laughs) than in his Southern Baptist congregation. And so I remember sitting next to him and um, feeling really both 
uh, not quite sure how to relate to him because it was so different, but also feeling really safe in his presence because it was full of so much, his being was full of so much integrity, so much deep listening, sit there with his eyes closed, like not trying to keep his body still. He would move a lot and, you know, vibe with whatever the pastor was talking about. And he was really not afraid to yell out the amens and the hallelujahs, right? And that wasn't a very common thing in our church. But I was like, oh, yeah, he's feeling it, right? He's really feeling the sacred. He's feeling into the depth of life right here. Some kind of honoring or appreciating is happening. And it was a similar experience. My mom was one of six, and so our family gatherings were quite big with kids and grandkids. And and there would always be a prayer where everybody would stand fill a big room, all the kids, adults, and often my grandpa would offer a prayer, and it would be a long prayer, and as a kid, (laughs) as a kid, I remember, like, you know, peeking, it's more curious about what was happening with the adults in this space, with their eyes closed, so much stillness in the room, you know, like an un... uh, imaginable amount of stillness from a lot of talking and exuberance to just stillness. And so looking around at my mom's face and my aunts and uncles and cousins and just feeling, you know, again in this moment, the sacred connection of life. And often in the prayer, the prayer would be embedded in suffering and challenge and Willingness to give thanks and have some gratitude in moments, even when there was struggle. And there was a lot of struggle in my family. So often there was a direct pointing and this real sincerity, this real authenticity. And not quite knowing, you know, what was happening in the hearts of these people that were there. But it felt like a time to honor. A time where we were all coming into some relationship, healthy relationship, authentic relationship with life. And that's one way that we could describe this teaching of emptiness, coming into a real sacred relationship with life, a way of honoring every expression of life because it is a force of nature. There's no avoiding that. There's no sense of trying to escape suffering. There's no sense of denying our challenges, our imperfections, the ways we fall short in taking care of each other. All of that gets to be included, just like it was in the prayers that I experienced as a kid. With a renewed commitment to feel into what it's like to be human and to learn, to keep learning to keep moving around the rocks, find a way to grow. And this knowing, this deep intuitive wisdom that can be felt in moments emerges from this spaciousness when we allow ourselves to connect to the sacred to connect to the sense of awe. When we, when the hearts, when our hearts drop the need to figure it out or diminish the experience by making it smaller so it fits into this nice conceptual box, into the binary, good or bad, man or woman even, whatever it is, welcome or unwelcome. And just one more example of a way to feel into emptiness in our ordinary lives, especially in the relational sense. I was having a conversation with someone, a one-on-one conversation on on, uh, Zoom like this with someone I really deeply trust in the conversation felt really authentic, like there was each of us really 
tapping into a, some deep, you know, truth to our own lived experiences, some vulnerability there. And, and at one point I looked up to gaze at my own face and I didn't really understand the expression on my face. And it was a beautiful moment of going like, oh yeah, you can't pin this down. When we truly honor life, it's hard to pin it down. I could have minimized it and said there was sadness or despair, or I could have done something like that. But in a moment there was just like, oh, look at that. This is, there's some truth here. And it doesn't make sense to put words to it. So perhaps we can set the intention and intentions are beautiful, beautiful, not like goals that we either succeed or fail out, but an intention we can reset in any moment, like an intention to feel into the sacredness of life, to understand nature in a deep way not by force, but by curiosity and awe to understand something about what, you know, what this is all this human experience is all about to understand something about the five khandas perhaps, or deepen into life in an undefined way. But perhaps we can just keep this in mind, right? It's not like our practice needs to become a project. But if we just keep this possibility in mind that we can relate to life with some awe, with some wonder, you know, it might just support us in finding that in some moments. I'll end with this quote at the end of the chapter. This is from Ajahn Chah. In the great void, the king of death will never find you. There is nothing for old age, sickness, and death to follow. When we see and understand in accordance with truth, that is, with right understanding, then there is only this great emptiness. It's here that there is no more we, no they, no self at all. Thanks for your kind listening, friends. We do have a little time if any of you have words to add into the space. They don't have to be well-constructed words. They never do. They can be emergent and an expression of life and the sacred right here. Yeah, finding safety in the heart that can be compassionate and connected, a richer kind of safety. Okay. Patrice. So let's um, commit this wonderful act of imaginative generosity and share share the merit tonight. So if there's any benefit from our practice together any goodness, any blessing, anything fortunate that would come to us from the time we've shared together tonight, the words we've heard, the teachings, the sharing, we would happily, gladly, joyfully 
share it with others. In fact, we, we would give it all away. And we could give it to parents and teachers, friends and family, our community, <clears throat> people known and unknown. But tonight, let's, um, let's make a special effort in our hearts to offer this on the six month anniversary of the death of George Floyd. Let's offer it to everyone who's been impacted by his murder, including the officers who have been charged with, uh, with his, his death, with aiding and abetting his death. Let's offer it to our leaders, our leaders-to-be, to all the persons with COVID, all the people caring for people with COVID. Let's offer it to the two-legged, the two-winged, the four-legged, all of us everywhere in worlds known and unknown. May we all find benefit. May we all in our own ways be liberated. And may we all somehow find a path to true peace. Amen. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone.